man? Are you known in the enemy's camp for these things? Are you seeking to bring them about? Are you fighting the dragon? If not, pick up your sword and fight. Pick up your sword and fight. Now, I will confess, my wife and I are blessed to be in a church like this, where much of what I mention is going on to some degree. We are blessed. We are blessed in this church that we have a pastor that regularly proclaims the Word of God to local civil magistrates. We have a church where many of the children are being raised with an education from a biblical worldview. Many of you are businessmen seeking to honor God with your work. Some of you are aspiring authors and writers, maybe even filmmakers, I don't know, and you want to make them all to the glory of God. Praise God. Some of you are abolitionists seeking to get bills passed that have equal protection for the babies in the womb. Praise God. I've spoken with some of you. You lost your previous ministry because you refused to compromise on God's word. I praise God for you. Your church is still open. I praise God. And those of you who proclaim the gospel in the public square, for you I say I praise God. To all this I say yes and amen. Praise the Lord. Continue on in these things. But we must heed the warning of Jesus here in this text. There is a warning in this text from our Lord. In verse 20. What does he say? Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We've looked at fighting the dragon. I want to look at the name of the warrior. The name of the warrior. What is our Lord saying? Do not rejoice in this. Well, Jesus is not saying that we can never rejoice in what God is doing through us or through others. And we know he's not saying that by this very text, but also others. Paul himself commended the works of the churches that he wrote to. Jesus himself commended the church in Revelation for their good works. He's not saying we can never rejoice at the good that God is doing through us. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is making an argument to find our primary our ultimate joy in something greater. But what is that greater thing? That greater thing is that our names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. And they were written there before the foundation of the world. That is what we must find our primary joy in. That is what we must have our ultimate joy in. Our joy must come from the fact that Christ has redeemed us more than our usefulness. Our joy must ultimately come from the fact that Christ has redeemed us more than our usefulness. Because if we are not careful, what began as rejoicing what God has done through us can turn into spiritual pride. We can begin to compare ourselves to others and place our value upon that. Our peace can begin to be determined by the results instead of our position in Christ. Or, we can become cold in our service and lacking in zeal. I have three examples for these things. One's good, one's mediocre, one's bad. First, the good example. The prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. One who God told, no one's going to listen to you. Could you imagine... If Jeremiah put his ultimate hope in his results, when God himself told him, I'm sending you, no one's going to listen. But Jeremiah knew, as he said, let not the rich man boast in his riches. Let not the strong man boast in his strength. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, that he understands and knows me. Jeremiah, I don't know if we're in a slump right now. I know that Christ will be successful. And better day glories to come. When many will bow the knee to Christ. I know, but in our part in history, we could be in a slump right now. 
That does not give us an excuse not to be faithful, not to work. It doesn't. But I'll tell you what, this is why this is so important. We labor and strive, but if our joy is in the results, we will be despondent. That's not what our master wants. Our master wants us to be faithfully working, and throughout the overwhelming timeline of history, he will be successful, but in our little pocket, if we're in this slump and we don't see many results, Jesus is saying, have joy in your position. Have joy that your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. The second example is a mediocre one. The church at Ephesus in Revelation. Commended for their works by Christ, did he not say all the good things they have done, but what did he rebuke them for? He rebuked them for their lack of warmth and zeal and intimacy towards him. And this is what happens when we over and put the ultimate joy in our effectiveness and our faithfulness is that we can become cold because we're too tempted to just look at ourselves and our work and not at the work of Christ. We must be careful. We do not want to lose our first love. We want to continue on our faithfulness. We want to be able to rejoice in the good things that God is doing through us, but our ultimate pinnacle joy must be that our names are written in heaven. And the last reason is a bad one about why we must rejoice ultimately that our names are written in heaven. Judas. Judas. In the previous chapter, a similar account happens with the 12 disciples. It almost looks identical to this one that we have in chapter 10. He appoints the apostles, sends them out, he says similar words to them, and they go out. You know what that means? That means that Judas, the false disciple, the one who said, Jesus said was a devil. Jesus wasn't surprised that Judas was false. He knew. He was casting out devils. He was performing miracles. That's amazing to me. Because, and you want to know the, the crazy thing is that if he wasn't doing those things, when Jesus says one of you is portraying, oh, it's Judas. He's always been odd. He's always been the odd man out. He can't cut. That's not what happened. He looked just like everybody else. His difference was his name wasn't written in heaven. And he is like those of Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, did I not cast out many demons in your name? Do mighty works in your name? Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, God can use a Roman to accomplish his will. He can use an Assyrian to accomplish his will. He can do that. But the people of God have something over the wicked that God chooses to use. They are loved and known by him in heaven. We must place our ultimate joy in that. Believer, rejoice primarily in where your name is written more than your usefulness. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe so you can get more video content from Twine and the Vine. And remember, I'd like to hear your thoughts, so please make a comment down below. God bless and catch you next time.